The Secret of the Fox Hunter by William LeCue Recording by Daniel Fraser It happened three winters ago. Having just returned from Stuttgart, where I had spent some weeks at the Macart, in the guise I so often assumed, that of Monsieur Gustave Dreux, commercial traveller of Paris, and where I had been engaged in watching the movements of two persons staying in the hotel, a man and a woman, I was glad to be back again in Bloomsbury to enjoy the ease of my armchair and pipe. I was much gratified that I had concluded a very difficult piece of espionage, and having obtained the information I sought, had been able to place certain facts before my chief, the Marquess of Macclesfield, which had very materially strengthened his hands in some very delicate diplomatic negotiations with Germany. Perhaps the most exacting position in the whole of British diplomacy is the post of ambassador at Berlin, for the Germans are at once our foes, as well as our friends, and are at this moment only too ready to pick a quarrel with us from motives of jealousy which may have serious results. The war cloud was still hovering over Europe, hence a swarm of spies, male and female, were plotting, scheming, and working in secret in our very midst. The reader would be amazed if he could but glance at a certain red-bound book, kept under lock and key at the Foreign Office, in which are registered the names, personal descriptions, and other facts concerning all the known foreign spies living in London and in other towns in England. But active as are the agents of our enemies, so also are we active in the opposition camp. Our empire has such tremendous responsibilities that we cannot now depend on mere birth, wealth and honest dealing, but must call in shrewdness, tact, subterfuge and the employment of secret agents in order to combat the plots of those ever seeking to accomplish England's overthrow. Careful student of international affairs that I was, I knew that trouble was brewing in China. Certain confidential dispatches from our minister in Peking had been shown to me by the Marquess, who, on occasion, flattered me by placing implicit trust in me, and from them I gathered that Russia was at work in secret to undermine our influence in the Far East. I knew that the grave, kindly old statesman was greatly perturbed by the grim shadows that were slowly rising, but when we consulted, on the day after my return from Stuttgart, his lordship was of opinion that at present I had not sufficient ground upon which to institute inquiries. For the present, Drew, he said, we must watch and wait. There is war in the air, first at Peking and then in Europe, but we must prevent it at all costs. Huntley leaves for Peking tonight with dispatches in which I have fully explained the line which Sir Henry is to follow. Hold yourself in readiness for you may have to return to Germany or Russia tomorrow. We cannot afford to remain long in the dark. We must crush any alliance between Petersburg and Berlin. A telegram to my rooms will bring me to your lordship at any moment, was my answer. Ready to go anywhere, eh, Drew? He smiled. And then, after a further chat, I left Downing Street and returned to Bloomsbury. Knowing that for at least a week or two I should be free, I left my address with Boyd and went down to Cotterstock in Northamptonshire to stay with my old friend of college days, George Hamilton, who rented a hunting box and rode with the Fitzwilliam pack. I had had a long-standing engagement with him to go down and get a few runs with the hounds, but my constant absence abroad had always prevented it until then. Of course, none of my friends knew my real position at the Foreign Office. I was believed to be an attaché. Personally, I am extremely fond of riding to hounds. Therefore, when that night I sat at dinner with George, his wife, and the latter's cousin, Beatrice Graham, I was full of expectation of some good runs. An English country house, with its old oak, old silver, and air of solidity, is always delightful to me, after the flimsy gym cracks of continental life. The evening proved a very pleasant one. Never having met Beatrice Graham before, I was much attracted by her striking beauty. She was tall and dark, about twenty-two, with a remarkable figure 
which was shown to advantage by her dinner gown of turquoise blue. So well did she talk, so splendidly did she sing Dupont's Jeune Fille, and so enthusiastic was she regarding hunting, that, before I had been an hour with her, I found myself thoroughly entranced. The meet, three days afterwards, was at Wandsford, that old-time hunting centre by the Nene, about six miles distant, and as I rode at her side, along the road, through historic Fotheringay and Nasington, I noticed what a splendid horsewoman she was. Her dark hair was coiled tightly behind, and her bowler hat suited her face admirably, while her habit fitted as though it had been moulded to her figure. In her mare's tail was a tiny piece of scarlet silk, to warn others that she was a kicker. At Wandsford, opposite the old haycock, once a hunting inn in the old coaching days, but now Lord Chesham's hunting box, the gathering was a large one. From the great rambling old house, servants carried glasses of slow gin to all who cared to partake of his lordship's hospitality, while every moment the meat grew larger and the crowd of horses and vehicles more congested. George had crossed to chat with the master, Mr. George Fitzwilliam, who had just driven up and was still in his overcoat. Therefore, I found myself alone with my handsome companion, who appeared to be most popular everywhere. Dozens of men and women rode up to her and exchanged greetings, and the men more especially, until at last Barnard, the huntsman, drew his hounds together. The word was given, and they went leisurely up the hill to draw the first cover. The morning was one of those damp cold ones of mid-February. The frost had given, and everyone expected a good run, for the scent would be excellent. Riding side by side with my fair companion, we chatted and laughed as we went along, until, on reaching the cover, we drew up with the others and halted while hounds went in. The first cover was, however, drawn blank, but from the second a fox went away straight for Elton, and soon the hounds were in full cry after him, and we followed at a gallop. After a couple of miles, more than half the field was left behind. Still we kept on, until of a sudden, and without effort, my companion took a high hedge, and was cutting across the pastures, ere I knew that she had left the road. That she was a straight rider I at once saw, and I must confess that I preferred the gate to the hedge and ditch, which she had taken so easily. Half an hour later, the kill took place near Haddon Hall, and of the half-dozen in at the death, Beatrice Graham was one. When I rode up five minutes afterwards, she smiled at me. Her face was a trifle flushed by hard riding, yet her hair was in no way awry, and she declared that she had thoroughly enjoyed that tearing gallop. Just, however, as we sat watching Barnard cut off the brush, a tall, rather good-looking man rode up, having apparently been left just as I had. As he approached, I noticed that he gave my pretty friend a strange look, almost as of warning, while she on her part refrained from acknowledging him. It was as though he had made her some secret sign which she had understood. But there was a further fact that puzzled me greatly. I had recognised in that well-turned-out hunting man someone whom I had had distinct occasion to recollect. At first I failed to recall the man's identity. But when I did, a few moments later, I sat regarding his retreating figure like one in a dream. The horseman who rode with such military bearing was none other than the renowned spy, one of the cleverest secret agents in the world, Otto Krempelstein, chief of the German Secret Service. That my charming little friend knew him was apparent. The slightest quiver in his eyelids and the most imperceptible curl of his lip had not passed me unnoticed. There was some secret between them, of what nature I, of course, knew not. But all through that day, my eyes were ever open to rediscover the man whose ingenuity and cunning had so often been in competition with my own. Twice I saw him again, once riding with a big, dark-haired man in pink, on a splendid bay, and followed by a groom with a second horse. 
and on the second occasion, at the edge of Stockhill Wood, while we were waiting together, he galloped past us, but without the slightest look of recognition. I wonder who that man is, I remarked casually, as soon as he was out of hearing. I don't know, was her prompt reply. He's often out with the hounds, a foreigner, I believe. Probably he's one of those who come to England for the hunting season. Since the late Empress of Austria came here to hunt, the Fitzwilliam has always been a favourite pack with the foreigners. I saw that she did not intend to admit that she had any knowledge of him. Like all women, she was a clever diplomatist. But he had made a sign to her, a sign of secrecy. Did Krempelstein recognise me, I wondered? I could not think so, because we had never met face to face. He had once been pointed out to me in the Wilhelmstrasse in Berlin, by one of our secret agents who knew him, and his features had ever since been graven on my memory. That night, when I sat alone with my friend George, I learned from him that Mr. Graham, his wife's uncle, had lived a long time on the continent as manager to a large commercial firm, and that Beatrice had been born in France and had lived there a good many years. I made inquiries regarding the foreigners who were hunting that season with the Fitzwilliam, but he, with an Englishman's prejudice, declared that he knew none of them and didn't want to know them. The days passed and we went to several meets together, at Apethorpe, at Castor Hanglands, at Laxton Park and other places, but I saw no more of Krempelstein. His distinguished-looking friend, however, I met on several occasions, and discovered that his name was Baron Stern, a wealthy Viennese, who had taken a hunting box near Stoke Doyle, and had as friend a young man named Percival, who was frequently out with the hounds. But the discovery there of Krempelstein had thoroughly aroused my curiosity. He had been there for some distinct purpose, without a doubt. Therefore, I made inquiry of Kersh, one of our secret agents in Berlin, a man employed in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and from him received word that Krempelstein was back in Berlin, and further warning me that something unusual was on foot in England. This aroused me at once to activity. I knew that Krempelstein and his agents were ever endeavouring to obtain the secrets of our guns, our ships, and our diplomacy with other nations, and I therefore determined that on this occasion he should not succeed. However much I admired Beatrice Graham, I now knew that she had lied to me, and that she was in all probability his associate, so I watched her carefully, and when she went out for a stroll or a ride, as she often did, I followed her. How far I was justified in this action does not concern me. I had quite unexpectedly alighted upon certain suspicious facts, and was determined to elucidate them. The only stranger she met was Percival. Late one afternoon, just as dusk was deepening into night, she pulled up her mare beneath the bare black trees while crossing Burley Park, and after a few minutes was joined by the young foreigner, who, having greeted her, chatted for a long time in a low, earnest tone, as though giving her directions. She seemed to remonstrate with him, but at the place I was concealed, I was unable to distinguish what was said. I saw him, however, hand her something, and then, raising his hat, he turned his horse and galloped away down the avenue in the opposite direction. I did not meet her again until I sat beside her at the dinner table that night, and then I noticed how pale and anxious she was, entirely changed from her usual sweet, light-hearted self. She told me that she had ridden into Stamford for exercise, but told me nothing of the clandestine meeting. How I longed to know what the young foreigner had given her. Whatever it was, she kept it a close secret to herself. More than once, I felt impelled to go to her room in her absence, and search her cupboards, drawers, and travelling trunks. My attitude towards her was that of a man fallen entirely in love, for I had discovered that she was easily flattered by a little attention. I was searching for some excuse to know Baron Stern, but often, for a week, he never went to the meets. 
it was as though he purposely avoided me. He was still at Weldon Lodge, near Stoke Doyle, for George told me that he had met him in Oundle only two days before. Three whole weeks went by, and I remained just as puzzled as ever. Beatrice Graham was, after all, a most delightful companion, and although she was, to me, a mystery, yet we had become excellent friends. One afternoon, just as I entered the drawing-room where she stood alone, she hurriedly tore up a note and threw the pieces on the great log fire. I noticed one tiny piece about an inch square remained unconsumed, and managed half an hour later to get possession of it. The writing upon it was, I found, in German, four words in all, which, without context, conveyed to me no meaning. On the following night, Mrs. Hamilton and Beatrice remained with us in the smoking room till nearly eleven o'clock, and at midnight I bade my host good night and ascended the stairs to retire. I had been in my room about half an hour when I heard stealthy footsteps. In an instant the truth flashed upon me. It was Beatrice on her way downstairs. Quickly I slipped on some things and noiselessly followed my pretty fellow guest through the drawing room, out across the lawn and into the lane beyond. White mists had risen from the river and the low roaring of the weir prevented her hearing my footsteps behind her. Fearing lest I should lose her, I kept close behind, following her across several grass fields until she came to Southwick Wood, a dark deserted spot away from road or habitation. Her intention was, evidently, to meet someone. So when, presently, she halted beneath a clump of high black firs, I also took shelter a short distance away. She sat on the fallen trunk of a tree and waited in patience. Time went on, and so cold was it that I became chilled to the bones. I longed for a pipe, but feared that the smell of tobacco or the light might attract her. Therefore I was compelled to crouch and await the clandestine meeting. She remained very quiet. Not a dead leaf was stirred. Not a sound came from her direction. I wondered why she waited in such complete silence. Nearly two hours passed, when, at last, cramped and half-frozen, I raised myself in order to peer into the darkness in her direction. At first I could see no one, but, on straining my eyes, I saw, to my dismay, that she had fallen forward from the tree trunk and was lying motionless in a heap upon the ground. I called to her, but received no reply. Then, rising, I walked to the spot, and in dismay threw myself on my knees and tried to raise her. My hand touched her white cheek. It was as cold as stone. Next instant I undid her fur cape and bodice, and placed my hand upon her heart. There was no movement. Beatrice Graham was dead. The shock of the discovery held me spellbound. But when, a few moments later, I aroused myself to action, a difficult problem presented itself. Should I creep back to my room and say nothing, or should I raise the alarm and admit that I had been watching her? My first care was to search the unfortunate girl's pocket, but I found nothing save a handkerchief and purse. Then I walked back, and, regardless of the consequences, gave the alarm. It is unnecessary here to describe the sensation caused by the discovery, or of how we carried the body back to the house. Suffice it to say that we called a doctor, who could find no mark of violence or anything to account for death, and yet she had expired suddenly without a cry. One feature, however, puzzled the doctor. Namely, that her left hand and arm were much swollen, and had turned almost black, while the spine was curved, a fact which aroused a suspicion of some poison akin to strychnia. From the very first, I held a theory that she had been secretly poisoned, but with what motive I could not imagine. A post-mortem examination 
was made by three doctors on the following day, but, beyond confirming the theory I held, they discovered nothing. On the day following, a few hours before the inquest, I was recalled to the Foreign Office by telegraph, and that same afternoon sat with the Marquess of Macclesfield in his private room, receiving his instructions. An urgent dispatch from Lord Rockingham, our ambassador at Petersburg, made it plain that an alliance had been proposed by Russia to Germany, the effect of which would be to break British power in the Far East. His Excellency knew that the terms of the secret agreement had been settled, and all that remained was its signature. Indeed, it would have already been signed, save for opposition in some quarters unknown. And while that opposition existed, I might gain time to ascertain the exact terms of the proposed alliance. No light task in Russia, be it said, for police spies exist there in thousands, and my disguise had always to be very carefully thought out whenever I passed the frontier at Verbalen. The Marquess urged upon me to put all our secret machinery in motion in order to discover the terms of the proposed agreement, and more particularly as regards the extension of Russian influence in Manchuria. I know well the enormous difficulties of the inquiry, his lordship said, but recollect, Drew, that in this matter you may be the means of saving the situation in the Far East. If we gain knowledge of the truth, we may be able to act promptly and effectively. If not, well. And the grey-headed statesman shrugged his shoulders expressively without concluding the sentence. Full of regret that I was unable to remain at Cotterstock and sift the mystery surrounding Beatrice Graham's death, I left London that night for Berlin, where, on the following evening, I called upon our secret agent, Kersh, who lived in a small but comfortable house at Teltov, one of the suburbs of the German capital. He occupied a responsible position in the German Foreign Office, but, having expensive tastes and a penchant for cards, was not averse to receiving British gold in exchange for the confidential information with which he furnished us from time to time. I sat with him, discussing the situation for a long time. It was true, he said, that a draft agreement had been prepared and placed before the Tsar and the Kaiser, but it had not yet been signed. He knew nothing of the clauses, however, as they had been prepared in secret by the minister's own hand. Neither could he suggest any means of obtaining knowledge of them. My impulse was to go on next day to Petersburg, yet somehow I felt that I might be more successful in Germany than in Russia, so resolved to continue my inquiries. By the way, the German said, you wrote me about Krempelstein. He has been absent a great deal lately, but I had no idea he had been to England. Can he be interested in the same matter on which you are now engaged? Is he now in Berlin? I inquired eagerly. I met him at Boxhagen three days ago. He seems extremely active just now. Three days ago, I echoed. You are quite certain of the day? I asked him this because, if his statement were true, it was proved beyond doubt that the German spy had no hand in the unfortunate girl's death. I am quite certain, was his reply. I saw him entering the station on Monday morning. At eleven o'clock that same night, I called at the British Embassy and sat for a long time with the ambassador in his private room. His Excellency told me all he knew regarding the international complication which the Marquess, sitting in Downing Street, had foreseen weeks ago, but could make no suggestion as to my course of action. The war clouds had gathered undoubtedly, and the signing of the agreement between our enemies would cause it, at once, to burst over Europe. The crisis was one of the most serious in English history. One fact puzzled us both, just as it puzzled our chief at home. Namely, if the agreement had been seen and approved by both emperors, why was it not signed? Whatever hitch had occurred, it was more potent than the will of the two most powerful monarchs in Europe. On my return to the hotel, I scribbled a hasty note and sent it by messenger to the house of the Imperial Chancellor's son in Charlottenburg. It was addressed to Miss Maud Baines, 
the English governess of the Count's children, who, I may as well admit, was in our employ. She was a young, ingenious and fascinating little woman. She had, at my direction, acted as governess in many of the great families in France, Russia and Germany, and was now in the employ of the Chancellor's son, in order to have opportunity of keeping a watchful eye on the great statesman himself. She kept the appointment next morning at an obscure café near the Berenstrasse. She was a neatly dressed, rather petite person, with a face that entirely concealed her keen intelligence and marvellous cunning. As she sat at the little table with me, I told her in low tones of the object of my visit to Berlin, and sought her aid. A serious complication has arisen. I was about to report to you through the embassy, was her answer. Last night the Chancellor dined with us, and I overheard him discussing the affair with his son, as they sat alone smoking after the ladies had left. I listened at the door, and heard the Chancellor distinctly say that the draft treaty had been stolen. Stolen? I gasped. By whom? Ah, that's evidently the mystery. A mystery for us to fathom. But the fact that somebody else is in possession of the intentions of Germany and Russia against England, believed to be a secret, is no doubt the reason why the agreement has not been signed. Because it is no longer secret, I suggested. Are you quite certain you've made no mistake? Quite, was her prompt answer. You can surely trust me after the intricate little affairs which I have assisted you in unravelling. When may I return to Gloucester to see my friends? Soon, Miss Baines, as soon as this affair is cleared up. But tell me, does the Chancellor betray any fear of awkward complications when the secret of the proposed plot against England is exposed? Yes, the Prince told his son in confidence that his only fear was of England's retaliation. He explained that, as far as was known, the secret document, after being put before the Tsar and approved, mysteriously disappeared. Every inquiry was being made by the confidential agents of Russia and Germany, and further, he added, that even his trusted Krempelstein was entirely nonplussed. Mention of Krempelstein brought back to me the recollection of the tragedy in rural England. You've done us a great service, Miss Baines, I said. This information is of highest importance. I shall telegraph in cipher at once to Lord Macclesfield. Do you, by any chance, happen to know a young lady named Graham? I inquired, recollecting that the deceased woman had lived in Germany for several years. She responded in the negative, whereupon I drew from my pocket a snapshot photograph, which I had taken of one of the meets of hounds at Wandsford, and handing it to her, inquired if she recognised any of the persons in it. Having carefully examined it, she pointed to Baron Stern, whom I had taken in the act of lighting a cigarette, and exclaimed, Why, that's Colonel Davidoff, who was secretary to Prince Obolensky when I was in his service. Do you know him? No, I answered, but he has been hunting in England as Baron Stern of Vienna. This man is his friend, I added, indicating Percival. And that's undoubtedly a man whom you know well by repute. Moore, chief of the Russian secret service in England. He came to Prince Obolensky's once, when he was in Petersburg, and the princess told me who he was. Unfortunately, I had not been able to include Beatrice in the group. Therefore, I had only her description to place before the clever young woman who had, on so many occasions, gained knowledge of secrets where I and my agents had failed. Her part was always a difficult one to play, but she was well paid, was a marvellous linguist, and for patience and cunning was unequalled. I described her as minutely as I could, but still she had no knowledge of her. She remained thoughtful a long time, and then observed, You have said that she apparently knew more. He has, I know, recently been back in Petersburg. Therefore, they may have met there. She may be known. Why not seek for traces of her in Russia? It seemed something of a wild goose chase. Yet, 
with the whole affair shrouded in mystery and tragedy as it was, I was glad to adopt any suggestion that might lead to a solution of the enigma. The reticence of Mrs. Hamilton regarding her cousin, and the apparent secret association of the dead girl with those two notorious spies, had formed a problem which puzzled me almost to the point of madness. The English governess told me where in Petersburg I should be likely to find either the two Russian agents, Davidoff or Moore, who had been posing in England for some unknown purpose as hunting men of means. Therefore, I left by the night mail for the Russian capital. I put up at a small and not over-clean hotel, in preference to the Europe, and, compelled to carefully conceal my identity, I at once set about making inquiries in various quarters whether the two men had returned to Russia. They had, and had both had long interviews two days before, with General Zuboff, Chief of the Secret Service, and with the Russian Foreign Minister. At the Embassy, and in various English quarters, I sought trace of the woman whose death was such a profound mystery, but all in vain. At last, I suddenly thought of another source of information as yet untried, namely the register of the English charity in Petersburg, and on searching it I found to my complete satisfaction that about six weeks before Beatrice Graham applied to the administration and was granted money to take her back to England. She was the daughter, it was registered, of a Mr Charles Graham, the English manager of a cotton mill in Moscow who had been killed by an accident, and had left her penniless. For some months she had tried to earn her own living, in a costumier's shop in the Nevsky, and, not knowing Russian sufficiently well, had been discharged. Before her father's death, she had been engaged to marry a young Englishman, whose name was not given, but who was said to be tutor to the children of General Vraski, Governor-General of Warsaw. The information was interesting, but carried me no further. Therefore, I set myself to watch the two men who had travelled from England to consult the Tsar's chief adviser. Aided by two Russians, who were in British pay, I shadowed them day and night for six days, until, one evening, I followed Davidoff down to the railway station, where he took a ticket for the frontier. Without baggage, I followed him, for his movements were of a man who was escaping from the country. He has passed out across the frontier, and went on to Vienna, and thence direct to Paris, where he put up at the Hotel Terminus, Gare saint Lazar. Until our arrival at the hotel, he had never detected that I was following him. But on the second day in Paris, we came face to face in the large central hall, used as a reading room. He glanced at me quickly, but whether he recognised me, as the companion of Beatrice Graham in the hunting field, I have no idea. All I know is that his movements were extremely suspicious, and that I invoked the aid of all three of our secret agents in Paris to keep watch on him, just as had been done in Petersburg. On the fourth night of our arrival in the French capital, I returned to the hotel about midnight, having dined at the Café Américain with Greville, the naval attaché at the embassy. In washing my hands prior to turning in, I received a nasty scratch on my left wrist from a pin which a careless laundress had left in the towel. There was a little blood, but I tied my handkerchief around it, and, tired out, lay down and was soon asleep. Half an hour afterwards, however, I was aroused by an excruciating pain over my whole left side. A strange twitching of the muscles of my face and hands and a contraction of the throat, which prevented me from breathing or crying out. I tried to rise and press the electric bell for assistance, but could not. My whole body seemed entirely paralysed. Then the ghastly truth flashed upon me, causing me to break out into a cold sweat. That pin had been placed there purposely. I had been poisoned, and in the same manner as Beatrice Graham. I recollect that my heart seemed to stop, and my nails clenched themselves in the palms in agony. Then, next moment, I knew no more. 
When I recovered consciousness, Ted Greville, together with a tall, black-bearded man named Delisle, who was in the confidential department of the Quai d'Orsay, and who often furnished us with information, at a very high figure, be it said, was standing by my bedside, while a French doctor was leaning over the footrail watching me. "'Thank heaven you're better, old chap!' Greville exclaimed. "'They thought you were dead. You've had a narrow squeak. How did it happen?' "'That pin!' I cried, pointing to the towel. "'What pin?' he asked. "'Mind! Don't touch the towel!' I cried. "'There's a pin in it. A pin that's been poisoned!' That Russian evidently came here in my absence, and very cunningly laid a death trap for me. You mean Davidoff, chimed in the Frenchman. When, monsieur, the doctor has left the room, I can tell you something in confidence. The doctor discreetly withdrew, and then our spy said, Davidoff has turned traitor to his own country. I have discovered that the real reason of his visit here is because he has in his possession the original draft of a proposed secret agreement between Russia and Germany against England, and is negotiating for its sale to us for 100,000 francs. He had a secret interview with our chief last night at his private house in the Avenue de Champs-Élysées. Then it is he who stole it, after it had the Tsar's approval, I cried, starting up in bed, aroused at once to action by the information. Has he disposed of it to France? Not yet, it is still in his possession. And he is here? No, he has hidden himself in lodgings in the Rue Lafayette, number 247, until the foreign minister decides whether he shall buy the document. And the name by which he is known there? He is passing as a Greek named Gaionardios. Keep a strict watch on him, he must not escape, I said. He has endeavoured to murder me. A watch is being kept, was the Frenchman's answer, as, exhausted, I sank again upon the pillow. Just before midnight, I entered the traitor's room in the Rue Lafayette, and when he saw me, he fell back with blanched face and trembling hands. No doubt my presence here surprises you, I said, but I may as well at once state my reason for coming here. I want a certain document which concerns Germany and your own country the document which you have stolen to sell to France. What do you mean, monsieur? he asked, with an attempted hauteur. My meaning is simple. I require that document, otherwise I shall give you into the hands of the police for attempted murder. The Paris police will detain you until the police of Petersburg apply for your extradition as a traitor. You know what that means, Schusselburg. Mention of that terrible island fortress dreaded by every Russian, caused him to quiver. He looked me straight in the face, and saw determination written there. Yet he was unyielding, and refused for a long time to give the precious document into my hands. I referred to his stay at Stoke Doyle, and spoke of his friendship with the spy Moore, so that he should know that I was aware of the truth, until at last he suggested a bargain with me, namely, that in exchange for the draft agreement against England, I should preserve silence and permit him to return to Russia. To this course I acceded, and then the fellow took from a secret cavity of his travelling bag a long official envelope, which contained the innocent-looking paper, which would, if signed, have destroyed England's prestige in the Far East. He handed it to me, the document for which he hoped to obtain 100,000 francs and in return I gave him his liberty to go back to Russia unmolested. Our parting was the reverse of cordial, for undoubtedly he had placed in my towel the pin which had been steeped in some subtle and deadly poison, and then escaped from the hotel in the knowledge that I must sooner or later become scratched and fall a victim. I had had a very narrow escape, it was true, but I did not think so much of my good fortune in regaining my life, as the rapid delivery of the all-important document into Lord Macclesfield's hands, which I effected at noon next day. My life had been at stake, for I afterwards found that a second man had been his accomplice, but happily I had succeeded in obtaining possession of the actual document, 
the result being that England acted so promptly and vigorously that the situation was saved, and the way was, as you know, opened for the Anglo-Japanese Treaty, which, to the discomfiture of Germany, was effected a few months later. Nearly two years have gone by since then, and it was only the other day, by mere accident, that I made a further discovery which explained the death of the unfortunate Beatrice Graham. A young infantry lieutenant, named Bellingham, having passed in Russian, had some four years before entered our secret service, and been employed in Russia on certain missions. A few days ago, on his return to London, after performing a perilous piece of espionage on the Russo-German frontier, he called upon me in Bloomsbury, and in course of conversation, mentioned that about two years ago, in order to get access to certain documents relating to the Russian mobilisation scheme for her western frontier, he acted as a tutor to the sons of the Governor-General of Warsaw. In an instant, a strange conjecture flashed across my mind. Am I correct in assuming that you knew a young English lady in Russia named Graham, Beatrice Graham? He looked at me straight in the face, open-mouthed in astonishment, yet I saw that a cloud of sadness overshadowed him instantly. Yes, he said, I knew her. Our meeting resulted in a terrible tragedy. Owing to the position I hold, I have been compelled to keep the details to myself, although it is the tragedy of my life. How? Tell me, I urged sympathetically. Ah, he sighed, it is a strange story. We met in Petersburg, where she was employed in a shop in the Nevsky. I loved her, and we became engaged. Withholding nothing from her, I told her who I was, and the reason I was in the service of the Governor-General. At once, instead of despising me as a spy, she became enthusiastic as an Englishwoman, and declared her readiness to assist me. She was looking forward to our marriage, and saw that if I could effect a big coup, my position would at once be improved, and we could then be united. He broke off and remained silent for a few moments, looking blankly down into the grey London street. Then, he said, I explained to her the suspicion that Germany and Russia were conspiring in the Far East, and told her that a draft treaty was probably in existence, and that it was a document of supreme importance to British interests. Judge my utter surprise when, a week later, she came to me with the actual document, which she said she had managed to secure from the private cabinet of Prince Korolkov, director of the private chancellery of the emperor, to whose house she had gone on a commission to the princess. Truly, she had acted with a boldness and cleverness that were amazing. Knowing the supreme importance of the document, I urged her to leave Russia at once, and conceal herself with friends in England, taking care always that the draft treaty never left her possession. This plan she adopted, first, however, placing herself under the protection of the English charity, thus allaying any suspicions that the police might entertain. Poor Beatrice went to stay with her cousin, a lady named Hamilton in Northamptonshire. But the instant the document was missed, the secret services of Germany and Russia were at once agog, and the whole machinery was set in motion, with the result that two Russian agents, an Englishman named Moore and a Russian named Davidoff, as well as Krempelstein, chief of the German service, had suspicions, and followed her to England with the purpose of obtaining repossession of the precious document. For some weeks they plotted in vain, although both the German and the Englishman succeeded in getting on friendly terms with her. She telegraphed to me, asking how she should dispose of the document, fearing to keep it long in her possession. But, not being aware of the desperate character of the game, I replied that there was nothing to be feared. I was wrong, he cried bitterly. I did not recognise the vital importance of the information. I did not know that empires were at stake. The man Davidoff, who posed as a wealthy Austrian baron, had by some means discovered that she always carried the precious draft concealed in the bodice of her dress. Therefore, he had recourse to a dastardly ruse. From what I have since discovered, he one day succeeded in concealing in the fur of her cape 
a pin impregnated with a certain deadly arrow poison unknown to toxicologists. Then he caused to be dispatched from London a telegram purporting to come from me, urging her to meet me in secret at a certain spot on that same night. In eager expectation, the poor girl went forth to meet me, believing I had returned unexpectedly from Russia. But in putting on her cape, she tore her finger with the poisoned pin. While waiting for me, the fatal paralysis seized her, and she expired, after which Davidoff crept up, secured the missing document, and escaped. His anxiety to get hold of it was to sell it at a high price to a foreign country. Nevertheless, he was compelled first to return to Russia and report. No one knew that he actually held the draft, for to Krempelstein, as well as to Moore, my poor love's death was believed to be due to natural causes, while Davidoff, on his part, took care to so arrange matters that his presence at the spot where poor Beatrice expired could never be proved. The spies, therefore, left England reluctantly after the tragedy, believing that the document, if ever possessed by my unfortunate love, had passed out of her possession into unknown hands. And what of the assassin Davidoff now? I inquired. I have avenged her death, answered Bellingham with set teeth. I gave information to General Zuboff of the traitor's attempted sale of the draft treaty to France, with the result that the court-martial has condemned him to incarceration for life in the cells below the lake at Schusselburg. End of The Secret of the Fox Hunter by William Lecoux